Many people like to think that this whole idea of barefoot running or natural movement is new, but what if it's actually really old and we have not been learning from the masters of it? We're going to find out more about that on today's episode of the Movement Movement Podcast, the podcast for people who want to know the truth about what it takes to run, to walk, to hike, or whatever it is you like to do enjoyably and effectively, about how to use your body naturally, starting, you know, feet first, how to have a happy, healthy, strong body feet first. That's the way I like to say it, because those things are your foundation. We call it the Movement Movement because we're creating a movement that involves people like you about movement and that about, about making natural movement the obvious, better, healthy choice the way natural food currently is. I'm Stephen Sashin from ZeroShoes.com, your host. By the way, if you like what happens here and you want to find out more, just go to www.jointhemovementmovement.com. That's where you'll find all the past episodes and all the different places you can interact with what we're doing here so you can be part of the movement about movement. All right, so uh, shall we? This is our socially distant distance. I don't know if it looks as distant as it is, but it's really odd. We, we tried doing this as a, as a Zoom call where we were sitting on opposite ends of the conference room table, but it didn't work. The technology did not make it happen. So um, I hate doing intros for people. Joseph, why don't you tell people who the hell you are and why you're here? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me, Stephen. Pleasure. My name is Joseph Mora, and I am a Zero Shoes wearer, sandal wearer as well. Who do? Um, I'm originally from Southern California, and I've been running on and off for most of my life. Um, I have been running uh, in the barefoot fashion um, for about t- 10, 12 years now. And um, I have been a student of uh, Native American thought and philosophy for most of my life. I live in the Southwest. Um, and um, have a lot of roots there. So um, what I try to do is take the um, philosophies, tenets of the Hopi way and the Native American way of being and running and incorporate those into my lifestyle somehow. And it's, it's really interesting. It's a perfect time right now, I think, in America to, to try and look back on our foundations and our roots because in the last several decades there's been a lot of recent discoveries about ancient america um you know first and foremost i think the the theory of clovis culture which we're all familiar with the arrow heads and they're fluted a particular way um which places native americans at the outset of America, some somewhere around 13,400 years ago. And that whole date recently has been thrown out the window. So correspondingly, the Bering Land Bridge theory in which America was populated by... Uh, came you, from Siberia, basically. That's, that's yeah. correct, when, when the sea levels were, were lower. Um, also... Out the window. Which is, of course, silly because we know people came over on a Carnival Cruise line. <laughs> that's right. That's the They're still docked in that's... San Francisco Bay right now going around. Oh, so, really? Uh, yeah. Hopefully, they'll, they'll let them out soon. Oh, um, so, we're looking now about 130,000 years ago. Oh, wow. Um, that serious archaeological finds have, have been placing the time at as far as not just being around, but being highly advanced, moving around, designing things, designing geometrical patterns, shapes um, in the landscape, which are obviously tied to astronomical phenomena mm-hmm. at particular times of the year. So we have a very advanced civilization here. And I think that on top of that, what a lot of people haven't really been exposed to is the fact that um, during the so-called Younger Dryas period of the Ice Age, we North America, in particular, was just absolutely bombarded with meteoric showers, right? Huh. So this was about 12,800 years ago. So the, the comet and its effects went all over planet Earth, mostly concentrated on North America, Canada, a little bit over into across the Pacific Ocean into Greenland, um, a little bit of uh, the UK area. But what that did essentially was shut America off for, am I out of the way? There we go. <laughs> for for 12,000 years, essentially. So the fact that when people were coming to find 
America. They right. were looking for something that they had already kind of known, but had slipped into the consciousness of the world back into where this place that they used to just call it the middle place. Hmm. We call it, Native Americans call it Turtle Island. Okay, so if you look at the map of the world, Turtle Island is floating out there in the middle of nowhere. Hmm. We have an ocean on either side of us protecting us. So for a good 11,000 years, there was a civilization developing here, untouched by anybody, okay, that had reached a, a point where running, living, breathing, all these different things were at an extremely high level. And, you know, in, in India, they're developing yoga at this time, right? Right. In China, they're developing the martial arts. And all of these things are based on the movements of nature, animals, water, all of these things. In America, we're developing running, okay? Also based on animals, water, wind, all these different uh, aspects are tied into and are the bedrock of Native American running. So this is all based on, we'll call it the Hopi way. So in Native America, as soon as we start talking about Native Americans, uh, we can go, you know, we have Eastern peoples, we have Southwestern peoples, we have Canadian, Tarahumara down in Mexico. In the Hopi way, and in the Hopi tradition, all of these peoples were part of a large exodus, right? The Hopi way is to come out and we come out onto this fourth world from the third world, which was destroyed by greed and destruction, people getting too, too big ego. So that was destroyed. We come out here. We... We're trying to find a spiritual path, right? We're trying to find a way to... What the Hopi were trying to do was explore this, this land. So it's all about mobility. It's all about as soon as you come out to the, to the fourth world, check it out. We're going to break up into clans. You guys go north, south, east, and west. We're going to divide it up. The Hopis say they went all the way down to South America and back all the way up to Canada and back, and all the way out to the both coasts and back. Some people say this isn't the case. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Um, in any event, whoever's right or wrong, we know that Native America is all interwoven and interlocked. You'll find way more similarity rather than difference in any of that. So that doesn't matter. That, does, that goes out over time. So we have, from the very beginning, this the sense that you go out, you journey, you're looking, you're seeking, you're seeking to stop moving hmm. by finding home. Home is the Hopi place, right? Just like the Aztec said, well, we had to find our home. Hmm. Hopi's wandering around. So you're, you're moving, there's no cars, there's no, there's no nothing. For years and years and years, this is happening, Stephen, for so thousands of years. You're suggesting that um, this is not like Wakanda, where they had developed uh, advanced uh, solar technology. No, well, okay. Well, actually, solar, maybe. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, that's... I was, I was going to say <laughs> nuclear, but then I couldn't remember exactly what was... Actually, I, now I remember what was powering all the stuff. Sure. Wakanda. Suffice it to say, I mean, yes, this is a, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting thing. Human beings now, we often think of earlier civilizations as being less than or lesser when they were doing things that were actually quite advanced in certain domains and according to us post-industrial revolution you know less so in others um, but uh, but a lot of the technology that may have been developed and used in those earlier civilizations is stuff that wouldn't last through an archaeological period anyway. That's right. So you wouldn't be able to find evidence of some of these things. <laughs> right. So some right. now I'm not suggesting you know that they're all that they were all predating Einstein and figuring out sure. the math of the universe. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, it's it's fascinating just to me about the things that are techno. Let's call them sophisticated from the standpoint of having a thriving civilization and community mm -hmm. versus something that 
you know, is going to be dug up 10,000 years from now and still working. Right. And it's interesting that you bring up the, the scientific um, connection as well, because so we're talking about a belief that running extra miles and putting breath out in the right frame of mind will help bring rain back to your fields, right? So you can eat and feed your family because you know, it's got to rain, particularly in the southwest, right? right? On the Hopi plateaus, that's life is focused around that. So we have this connection between breath and life, right? And prayer. To the modern mind, the idea that you that that running can produce rain is is absolutely simply ridiculous. But chaos theory teaches us that you know it's the butterfly effect, and it's really a cumulative influence of a small change in a system. It may be an increase or decrease in temperature or weather. It could be Gandhi standing up for something. It could be a Native American person offering breath for a prayer, but it well, shows that everything's everything's interrelated. Yes, and just for the sake, because I'm because I'm, 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 yes. I'm, I'm a dork about these things. Sure. So what chaos theory really says is small initial changes lead to large future changes that are mostly unpredictable. That's correct. So it's not like the butterfly effect doesn't mean that if I move this, suddenly Google stock is going to go up. That's right. So it's just an unpredictable thing. There's so many confounds that lead to these. I mean, do, do you know how um, uh, chaos theory was originally discovered? Uh, by Lorenz and the deterministic non-periodic well, airflow. So it's no, actually it was a mistake. Well, there was there was a, there was a more <laughs> interesting one, which was which was someone basically running running with some weather sim where it became popular. Someone running weather simulations sure. and running a simulation and then wanting to rerun it but not having the time to do it. So starting with the with an initial condition that they thought was identical. But um, like they ran the whole series, but then wanted to look at the last half of the series again. So they just took the value in the middle of the series, ran it again, and got massively different results. And only realized after the fact that the calculations they were using went to like you know two orders of magnitude more granular. So like a, a, a millionth of a degree versus right. a thousandth of a degree kind right. of thing. Um, and that tiny itty bitty change that they couldn't see. Uh, in the printouts, but they could see in the code, made this massive difference, sure. and that was sort of the evolution of, of just the study of chaotic behavior or or nonlinear movement or you know all those other things. Sure. So anyway, be that as it may, um, what you made me think of is this. There's actually I remember hearing this on NPR. Somebody who studied to become a shaman in in some tribe I don't remember which, and did it mostly to prove that it was all bullshit and went through the entire training, and part of the training was how you would do a psychic healing. And it involved taking a, um, um, a bunch of feathers and putting them in your mouth surreptitiously so people didn't know, and then biting your cheek hard enough to get blood, and then you would basically pretend to be extracting something from the person, and you'd be taking this bloody mass of feathers and using that as proof that you would remove something. Anyway, the punchline of the story is the guy, and this, this happened 100 and something years ago, the, so he saw that this was like totally fake. And then the, like the daughter of a tribal leader had some illness, and as part of this guy's uh, ordination, if you will, had to do this ceremony to heal her, and did this totally fake thing, and she got better. <laughs> and it left him in this real conundrum, like, sure. what do I do? I know that I just faked it, sure. and I saw that she got better. Sure. Now, what do you predict he did with that conflict? I have no idea. Take a guess. He's got two choices: basically show that it's a scam, or some, who, you know, some other variation. I mean, keep going, I guess. <laughs> I, I imagine he probably kept going. He did. He became a shaman in that community, sure, and knew that what he was doing didn't work for the reasons that people thought. Right. And I guess that's the point that I'm going sure. to. Sure. There's things that may have impacts for reasons that we don't know. Sure. But they also may be coincidental. Sure. And those things can possibly live in a in a worldview mm -hmm. that's consistent in a way that we can't even contemplate because we think our worldview is the right one and sure. the only one and all others are silly. Like we don't, we don't even understand, given the time we're in, I'm going to bring up China. In, in China, they, there's a different worldview about many, many things that we think is somehow either inferior or, or 
we, we think it's just a, like a silly thing that they think. But it's actually totally consistent and in many situations works better and is more effective and more efficient than what the way that we view the world. Right. And it, it's very hard for people to understand that you can have a completely different belief system that's as consistent as the one that you have right. and as effective as the one that you have. Sure. Um, so there's a book called, I'll stop ranting in a second, there's a, book called, <laughs> there's a book called Poorly Made in China that is talking about how difficult it is to get things made. It's, it's really about mm -hmm. China, but it's really true anywhere. Right. <clears throat> but what it highlights about China is that there's a, an idea about how to run business mm. that is very, very different than the idea that we have here. And it really, really works over there. And is, there's some giant hurdles between ours and theirs that are very difficult to surmount. Mm. And because of that, that causes certain problems. It doesn't mean that all things are made badly in China, far from it. Sure. Um, but but it, 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 it's really one of the best cross-cultural exposés I've ever written where you really start to understand how someone else can think completely opposite to you, and it makes sense. And that if you grew up in that, that's what you'd be doing. And again, in certain circumstances, it's actually more effective than the things that we do. Mm -hmm. So anyway, to the point about <laughs> running and yeah, interconnectedness, sure, et cetera, sure. you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated thing to, to evaluate. And while I don't, on the one hand, I, I, I don't want to say it, I think there's a way of being, of thinking critically about some of these things without being mm, derogatory or condescending sure. or, um, um, and it doesn't mean that running necessarily caused the rain, but there but there may be something related to in there that's relevant, even if going out running didn't make it rain. Sure, I think it's also, you know, there's the the cumulative of cumulative effect as well. In that we have, you know, in if we're going to go back to Native American thought and in, in their way of thinking rather than just us sitting in the room here, we have a group of individuals all focused on one common goal. So everything that we're doing is based around that from waking till sleeping. So this is a type of focus that I don't think the modern mind really has so much anymore, perhaps a we little bit. We but don't frame it that way. Correct. We, but, yes. But there are, I mean, we look, there are goals that we all seem to agree about, typically having to do with the accumulation of wealth. Mm -hmm. for one, sure. which is something that's interesting. I mean, it's very interesting to me, given what's going on right now with COVID, sure. because there are other people in the world who have a different relationship to the accumulation of wealth. So in countries where they have um, uh, free health care for all, for example, sure. very different idea because you don't need to accumulate money to take care of yourself in the future. That's right. So the level of stress in those countries around medical care is way, way down. Um, and, but it also leads to different behaviors. Things like, you know, Germans taking vacations for the entire month of August, which I'm totally jealous of. <laughs> um, uh, and again, here in America, we sure. think that those are silly ways of behaving, but that's because we haven't lived there and experienced what that engenders. Exactly. Um, so, I mean, and, and what people also don't realize, and this is a weird tangential rant, a lot of the things that we think of about the accumulation of wealth have to do with the design of the financial and monetary system. And what that means specifically is the way we have it worked out is that if you have money, you can put it in a bank and just by having it sit there, you can accumulate more. And so because we have, the agreement is that money can accumulate interest, there's a value in having more sooner um, and not planning for the future the same way. But there were times where if you put money in storage, it would get taxed. And so people didn't want to keep it in storage. They wanted to use it for something that would be long lasting and valuable, like you know houses made of stone and aqueducts and pyramids and great walls and cathedrals and all these things where you know you do it once and then you're done for 500 years. Right, right. And so it was a very different attitude about money where you used it as little as you could get away with because you didn't want to lose it. Right. By right. holding on to it, so different behaviors just by something that we think of as, you know, as just the way it is, mm. but it's not the way it is. Yeah. Or, or there's many other ways that it could be. 
That's, anyway. The, or, and and there, are, there are other ways that we just don't know about that are probably happening right now, but those, those are so. So let's, let's, let's jump, if you will, if we can, into the running thing. Okay. And, and the, you know, we have this phenomenon of people getting hip to barefoot running in part because of the Tarumara, and made popular when Chris McDougall's book Born to Run came out, um, and in part from Daniel Lieberman and research he did with, with um, typically, sure. typically barefoot runners in Africa. Mm -hmm. and the Harvard so, study. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the Native American sure. version of this sure. and what you've learned about running sure. from all your research sure. and experience. And, and, yeah. In, so we're, we're talking about, I think the first thing we we're trying to do is just try to uh, establish the, the sacred element to it, which, you know, we don't want to be too glib about this. Yeah. You know, we, we want to make sure that, you know, when I run, I, I don't want to try and sound like I'm preaching, but, you know, I try to be in the right frame of mind. It's a, it's a very special, serious thing for me. Um, it, as, as I think for most of us, that's when we feel alive. That's why you run, right? I mean, I'm not a religious person, really. I, I Running is kind of my religion and my thoughts that I think when I'm running. In an, and I think this is like a Native American way, too. So along with that, we have we have place naming, right? Mm. So we're creating with our minds, we're using our imagination. And I think that's one of the things let's, we'll get into the, the, um, the blueprint of actual, the running, but we're, we're, let's focus on the mind a little bit still more. Well, let's just start with the simplest thing you said sure. is the mindset that you have about running and why you run. Right. And that's something people very rarely think about. Maybe they have certain experiences that sure. they anchor to. Right. But imagine what it would be like, I'm just th thinking, imagine what it would be like if we lived in a culture that thought running was important for some completely different reason. Um, and that it, that it was a communal event that had to occur for some reason that sure. bound the community together, telegraphed something to enemies. I mean, I can think of it in you know, right. a number of ways. But, but just the idea of, of, of that running can have an, an other meaning both to a group and to individuals is something that I don't think many people think about. Yeah. And that's a really interesting idea. I mean, as a non-distance runner, I don't get a lot of time to think <laughs> as a sprinter. I mean, I basically have three thoughts when I'm running the 100 meters. One is, is stay down and drive, uh, lean into the transition, and then hold on. And that's really all I get. Um, and uh, my, workouts are, my workouts are done before you've got your shoes laced up. So, I, but at the same time, but it's intense, right? And in that period, you're 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 feeling and thinking well, very different things. Well, than yes, and you know, and there's other things that happen. Like uh, when I got back into sprinting, one of the most difficult lessons was to not pay attention to the people who were next to me, because if I start trying to catch them, oh, yeah. things tighten up, or if I'm worried about them catching me, things tighten up. But there's, pardon me, there's also another component that I love. There is a it's not quite a, well, there is a ritualistic thing to sprinting. On your marks, set, go. And what I can tell you is that between set and the gun going off is the quietest my mind ever is and ever has been despite decades and decades of meditation. It's entirely effortless that in the waiting, in the anticipating of the gun, everything is totally still, and which is super, super fun. And there's another thing that I do before every race. Um, I look at the, I look at the where I'm going, and I realize that the feeling of three dimensionality is because we have eyes that are in different places, and our brain puts that together into something that looks three dimensional. But if you close one eye or just realize that that 3D thing is only happening because of something happening in your brain, it's as if it flattens out, and I'm looking at a two dimensional picture. Mm -hmm. And so then that hundred meters doesn't seem like it's more than this far away. Right. And so there's this weird spatial, con what I, what's the word, I'm like, collapsing that I do before I get in the blocks. I don't know why, it's just very entertaining to have this idea that I'm really not going anywhere <laughs> while I'm doing this crazy thing to go right. somewhere. Right. And that, that almost paradoxical nature of it is something that I really love. Mm -hmm. And I, don't, I haven't talked about that a lot and haven't heard people talk about it. Um, but anyway, so there is, there, there is a component for me that is more than just going out and putting in the numbers. Sure, sure. And, and, and I'm and sure it, that's true for everyone in some way. Right. 
I, I, I hope it is. <laughs> so yeah, to get back to the to the original thought, I, it, it's the place naming that comes about, and I use this all the time in Native American running. You know, we place naming doesn't it doesn't take any. You don't have to be trained in anything. You don't have to have any deep psychic ability. All it takes is asking the question. You know, running around to a place. This morning I was running out and looking out at the flat irons and thinking to myself, huh, this is interesting. This is beautiful. Oh, big mountain of the north. Woo, look at you. Look at your power. What happened here? Who were the people that walked, that ran around this area? Now, if I looked here 5,000 years ago and I, I can just oh, take look back in my mind and try and look at my mind's eye and just think to myself, who was here? What mountain? What lessons does this mountain have to give me right now for breath? Right. Whenever I look at a mountain, it's it's it always reminds me: stand strong, breathe deep, be big, be strong, run hard. It's okay. All the way through the top, you see how the mountain always once in a while a mountain will have clouds appear to come out of the top of its head. Yeah. So when we're we're struggling for breath, we imagine that we're the mountain. And we're all the way deep down into our belly and our feet are touching the ground and we have air coming out from the top of our head down to the bottom of our feet okay so that reminds us how to run it keeps me in form a lot of the time when it's 20 mile 18 mile and you're like man this sucks i try to take a breath Look at the mountains. I'm lucky. I live in Albuquerque. I live in the Southwest. I have beauty all around me. You guys are lucky here. Anywhere you're at, it doesn't matter. Make your place. Have that place be something that I look at a place. Sometimes I, I drive by a place and I go, oh, yeah, that day when I was running over there, man, I didn't take any water. I didn't take anything with me. And that sucked. So I learned my lesson. So my lesson for that day when I drive by that corner that when I ran by that one time on the trail, I'm like, oh yeah, that's the day that I never have to remind myself. So, well, I want to pause again. So, the idea of naming something. So, I did research when I was an undergrad uh, at Duke. I did research, cognitive psychology research, and uh, to to abbreviate the story dramatically, one of the things is if we don't have a label for something, we don't process information about it. And so in hearing what you're describing is very interesting of just naming places, a place naming, because it, when you do that, it's giving your mind an anchor for something to then do everything else you just described. So, it's, so there's, a, there's a wonderful um, transpersonal quality to what you're describing, and there's also a very simple version of that that's, again, equally profound from a completely different perspective. And we did, I mean, the research was really cool about this, where you show that people just can't process information about stuff if they don't know how to identify the That's stuff. Right. And they can arbitrarily identify the stuff. You can make up a name and you could call this Fliffus. <laughs> that's right. And then people would still go, oh, it's the Fliffus. Oh, yes. And then they'd make it, up a whole right. thing about Fliffuses. <laughs> and they'd start to investigate the Fliffus. And a Fliffus, by the way, is a twisting <laughs> somersault. Um, but, you know, until you, if you don't have a name for it, you just don't pay attention. That's right. In the same way. And, you know, so we're imbuing meaning by place naming, right? Yes. And, and since you're a science guy, you're, you're going to like this little just read this little section here for you so consider place naming um, in this regard the remarks of Niels Bohr great theoretical physicist right. while he was speaking in uh, June of 1924 with Heisenberg at Kohlberg Castle in Denmark so oh, at the beginning of the Copenhagen <laughs> okay so they're walking around Kohlberg Castle right and he says, isn't it strange how this castle changes as soon as anyone imagines that Hamlet lived here? <laughs> as scientists, we believe that a castle consists only of stones and admire the way the architect put them together. The stone, the green roof with its patina, the wood carvings in the church constitute the entire castle. Yet all we really know is that his name appears in a 13th century chronicle. No one can prove he really lived here. But everyone knows the questions Shakespeare had him ask, the human deaths he was made to reveal, and so he too had to be found on a place on earth, here in Kronberg. And once we know that, Kronberg becomes quite a different castle for us. 
And so, by one insightful account, does the country of the past transform and supplant the country of the present, that certain localities prompt such transformations, evoking as they do entire worlds of meaning, is not, as Neil Bohr recognized, a small or uninteresting truth. What's interesting about that is that this was the evolution of the Copenhagen uh, uh, interpretation of reality, let's say, of quantum mechanics and, um, and relativity. And the, the argument there is that, that evolved out of that is, is that thing materially changing? Or, like it says in there, or is it changing for us, which means we've just added meaning to it, yes. um, and and it is still ultimately a blank slate. Right. And there's there there are still people who both debate this and argue this and misinterpret this, um, but it's an, it, it it is an interesting question because it does the question that it really raises it, in my mind at least is what does it mean for us to be projecting meaning onto things and what value can we make of that and what problems does that create mm. as well mm -hmm. um, and uh, th there's there's a rash of both of those that's right um, but um, the, the physicist Richard Feynman had a, a variation on that where someone said to him well you see everything so dryly because you're a scientist he goes no when you look at a glass of water you see a glass of water but I see all the interactions of all the subatomic particles and it becomes so overwhelming that it's I can't even imagine that I could lift up the glass to drink the water and and it's not that anything changed but we have this remarkable ability to change ourselves internally with the stories that we attach to these things that's right that's and, right and picking a good story can be a very profound thing absolutely all you know if Either one of us were to visit Cronenberg Castle. We didn't know anything about it, or yeah. and, but, but if somebody just walked up and said, "Hey, this was this this was the scene of Hamlet," you walk around a little bit. Hey, maybe this was a courtyard where to be or not to be. Once you hear that, it's like okay, so now this is different. The way There's the guy in the corner, and he's up by him. And he's like he's ready to kill himself. You know, he's really struggling. So that changes everything for us, as Neil Bohr says. And and so we want to get back to to place making once again. Mm -hmm. In our world, so how would you? How, so other than the one example you gave, seeing the mountain, if you were going to give people instructions on how to use this as a practice and explore this, what would you tell them to do? Them, <laughs> look around. Look around where you're at. Understand where you're at. Right. I think the one thing we all struggle to do is find ourselves in place and time, mm. geographically at least. Find out where we're at. You know, if you live in Indiana. You live in Indiana. What's there? Look around you. Walk around. <laughs> Drive around your city. Drive around your state. Figure out where you're at and put that self, put yourself in a proximity with the rest of the planet. Mm. Okay, go all the way out. Now go all the way back mm. to where you're at mm. and use that mind journey on your own. And you know, for me, if I start taking off east, in my mind, I'll go east over the mountain goes a long way mm. so just keep going keep going the direction of the Sun is over there mm. the stars are over here pick out any, the things that are that are available to us for contextualization on planet Earth they never go away mm. this morning when I was running around here as I said earlier when we were talking there was some great stuff there was also some, some really boring monotonous commercial park stuff to, I think that the thing is, is to just figure out where you're at and in your mind, just mm. try and keep that golden place with you. If you're running at night and you live in the city and you're like, man, it's, you know, I'm feeling a little crazy. It's a little, you know, wherever you're running, just, just, just try and don't get caught in your trap. Mm. Don't, that's my thing. I think it doesn't matter where you're at or what you're imagining. Put yourself out on the road, particularly when you're running. You can't be closing your mind in when you're running. When you're mm. running, you want to... Throw your net out. Mm. Cast your net. If you have no mountains around you, great. Then your net's the, the big uh, tower in the middle of town because you live in the Midwest and it's all flat. And, you know, so whatever, you, whatever your things are. So what you just said reminded me of something that I used to do um, more deliberately as a practice, mm. which is I'd toss a big question in my mind. I'd create this big net, and that's literally the image that I would use. And I would, and it's a question that I didn't have an answer for. And I would walk or run, and the idea that I used is that every experience that I was having, seeing something, feeling something, thinking something, 
whatever it was, was sort of like a syllable in a long sentence that's a coded answer to right. the question. Right, that's right. And um, everything gets really fun when you do that. It's like, it's just a long sentence that I just don't need to try to understand it. That's right. I just need to hear it, sure. and eventually something's going to happen. Sure. And it's a very, um, in fact, I mean, I can't help but, well, as I describe it, do it right now. And even just feeling the movement of my hands, I'm aware of the, how the, I'm moving through the air. That's right. And that's somehow that's right. an answer to some that's unspoken right. question. That's right. And then hearing your voice, that's seeing right. the image of you, all of that's these right. things. Doing that while running, I mean, to really take that on is, I hadn't thought about this in a long time, um, is super sure. fun. Sure. It, 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 it's totally fun and totally captivating. And yes, captivating. once you start training your mind to do that, your mind will crave it more and more. It's, it's nice. So moving on. So let's leave, talk- you, leave the earbuds off. If you yeah. have your dog, love your dog at home, but leave your dog. <laughs> don't run with your animal. Don't run with, don't run with anybody sometimes. Mm. What, what I'm, you're asking me about my thing? Mm. Spend some time by yourself. Go out there and, and, and face your demons and, and make sense of the world by yourself a little bit. And then when you come back home, that's part of the original journey that, that we were talking about with the Hopi. It's like, you know, part of the reason we run is so we can get home. Mm. We leave and then halfway out, no matter how far we think we're going, it's like, damn, like, okay, wow, that coffee or that beer is going to be good when I get home. Um, so let's just one more quick thing. Yeah. Well, we're still in the scientific mode. Okay, Stanley Milgram, you're familiar mm-hmm. with this gentleman? Okay, so six degrees of separation. Many people aren't, but yes. Okay, right. So, if you so want, do you want to, you want to no. tell them? Let's tell the it's people. Your, it's your story, so you, you do the intro. To so he's, Stanley's a social psychologist, yep. right? And he wanted to figure out the small world theory. The small world theory is the cocktail party where you and I don't know one another. We're at a cocktail party. We find out we know somebody in common. Gosh, dang, it's a small world. Milgram, that was the big problem at the time in 67. Right. People wanted to figure out connectivity. So he, he, he does kind of the offers, right? He's like, I, I, I don't want to know who you don't want. I want to know who you don't know. I want to know how to get into contact with all these people. So he, he, he does his, his thing, right? He, he does the, he, he gives letters to people. He does his. his well, the basic idea was was what can I do to get in touch with some random human That's being right. starting with the network that I have. He used Boston and Omaha, Nebraska, right? right? So he's like, how do I, how many How many people will it take to get a message to somebody that I don't know at all? Using the people that I do know. Right. So I think that it's, it, it's funny because the answer to that, you know, he asked everybody in, in, in 67 who, who, how many times do you think it's going to take to get to the person? People guessed in the hundreds. As we all know, it was just six. So right. hence, we have six degrees of separation. So in, in 1990, Guar does his play, Six Degrees of Separation. And it's funny because the themes of the play are chaos and control, which are he has the big Kandinsky painting. Yep. One side's painted chaos, the other side's painted control. It flips around the stage as it go around. The other thing is the loss of the imagination. And he has the character of Paul really talk about this. And I think this is really important to what we're getting to about, about running and imagining things and about place naming. And it's, it's funny to have the, um, let me find this, this quote here. A boy in his notes. Yes. Hmm. By the way, I, Go ahead. I, we did, we did that play. We did Six Degrees of Separation mm. when I was in college. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we did too. Great. So here we go. Great. Paul tells us in the play. Yeah. The imagination has been so debased and imagination, being imaginative, rather than being the linchpin of our existence, now stands as a synonym for something outside of ourselves, like science fiction or some new, tan- some new use for tangerine slices on raw pork chops. <laughs> What an imaginative summer recipe. In Star Wars, so imaginative. In Star Trek, so imaginative. In Lord of the Rings, all those dwarves, so imaginative. The imagination has been moved out of the realm of being our link, our most personal link with our inner lives and the world outside that world, this world we share. What is schizophrenia but a horrifying state where what's in here doesn't match up with what's out there? 
Why has the imagination become a synonym for style? Hmm. Paul says the imagination is the passport we create to take us into the real world. I believe that the imagination is another phrase for what makes us most uniquely us. In both positive and not so positive ways. <laughs> right. So I think what, what I try to imagine in my world is that I'm dealing with this. I'm controlling the chaos somehow and the chaos is controlling me somehow. We're all looking to, to minimize the chaos and have more control. Mm -hmm. So how do we do this? Mm -hmm. We try to exercise. We try to get our breath right. We try to do all these things. We try to organize ourselves and our bodies so we feel good about ourselves. And then we try to go outwards. I, I think that we're in a place, unfortunately, most of us were, and, and this happens to me too I, all the time. I'm, I'm not trying to posit myself as somebody who's above everybody else. I have plenty of problems. Um, but the running thing gets us back on our feet as it were every day from from ground zero you you mean you got to start sometime and another we're talking about native american ways okay the the way that they talk about doing things you get up at i get up at 5 30 in the morning you can't you know you gotta you have to push yourself mm -hmm. elliot kiptoga says the best time to plant a tree was 25 years ago okay if not today <laughs> so it's all about that practice you, your imagination will will connect to your repetition somehow if you can get those two together you can't just be oh i'm going to be all off in my imaginary world i'm i'm dreaming that i'm running you know i'm um <laughs> i'm elliot kipchoge <laughs> i you know that's not the way that it works it's about keeping your mind fresh while you're running you can uh, keep rhythm in your head sing songs make poems I do all these things these are all things that are that are just naming things and mm -hmm. we talked about that before so you're just you're occupying your time your mind you know the other day I'm running about a month ago in the morning and a bald eagle just comes soaring over my left shoulder and I I heard it and felt it coming up and you know, you don't know how you're going to feel in those those moments. Those are the those are the things that that just you can't cultivate or wish for. But you know, feeling at one with something like that is what I think running is supposed to make us do. Because we as humans see one another and we're like, yeah, okay, whatever. We're only human when something else that's not human sees us. So I'm thinking through Bald Eagle's eyes, thinking, okay, well, maybe he's celebrating me. Hey, look, this guy got up at 5.30 in the morning. It's not even <laughs> light yet. All right, brother, I'm right here with you. Let's go. <laughs> so I had this sense, you know, when you get those senses, if you open yourself up to the world, I mean, maybe a little buddy this morning when I was running could have been like, yeah, bro, you got it. Go on. You got this, you know, I, connect. My, my, my version of that is someone will say, well, you know, so, something so-and-so so happened and it's a sign. And I go, it could be a sign, but you have to remember who painted it. That's right. And, and, and the, point, the point that we're making that we've been really talking about a lot for the last, you know, however many minutes is again this whole thing of being the sign painter and how that can impact what you're doing as a runner as in anything really right. we're focusing on running is there anything else that you want to um, highlight or or talk about just about what you've learned from about running specifically beyond sure. other other sure. things that we want to dive into when i go to all the when i go to uh native american races and the runs which i suggest everybody should do just if you're like a sightseer and you want to go see america you know there's mm. The Tewanama race in uh, Hopi at Shingopavi Village on Memorial Day is a great race. I don't know if you're familiar with Louis Tewanama. He won the silver medal in the London Olympics in 1920. He's obviously... Mm -hmm. um, so that's a that's a good race. And you, if you show up the day before, which you should do because the race starts at 6 a.m. and there's no place to stay in Hopi, <laughs> um, the butterfly dance is the day before. So... Any Native American ceremony you want to go to and, and just check out and just, 
I suggest that because everything's tied together in the Native American way through uh, song and through dance and through prayer, prayer. And the dancing rhythm of all the dances is of your running rhythm. So mm. I can close my eyes and I can listen to the dancing rhythm. And I, the next day when I'm running, I can sure enough, that's it's a really fast two counts. Interesting. Right. All the time, okay? So if you see the dances, that's all they're doing, running in place. Is there is there anything, I mean, you know, the way we opened this was... That's just, not all they're doing. But. Oh, no, I get that. <laughs> you know, the, the way I opened this was really the fact that this whole natural movement, this barefoot things, people think is a, some new crazy thing, and it's actually not. And, of course, uh, for many, many, many years, no one could run in the kind of shoes that have been made for the last few years right. because they didn't exist. That's right. So, of course, um, for some of these races, people are running in moccasins, they're running barefoot, they're sure. running in sandals, they're running in all That's manner right. of things. What else What else have you seen, um, both seen in, from personal experience and research, that relates what the Native Americans have been doing for all this time and what people are trying to accomplish now? What can we learn from that to help make this transition to natural running? I'm, I, I know I'm, I'm sort of yeah. artificially separating out <laughs> the physical thing from sure. the experience. And right. I think, if, you know, what it, people may be, some people I imagine might even be disappointed that the biggest thing we're talking about is how to, for, I'll use this word without trying to be derogatory about it, how to manipulate our internal experience sure. to relate to our external world that's in a right. new way as that's we're right. doing it, which is sure. a very big thing. Sure. And that's a big part of what we're talking about. Sure. It's a, it's, it is a big It's thing. a native um, approach. But what on the technical side for the fun of it, what else can you share about that? Well, I think that, you know, we got to start with our feet first, right? And since we're we're particularly on this podcast, absolutely, I think that you want to get we want to get in touch with our feet again. We've we've become we want to shield ourselves, right? I think most people that are not runners that want to start running, you go to the, just the shop and you go pick up some shoes, and the guys say, "Hey, look at this thing on the on the heel. It's not going to hurt. You're going to be able to do this. You're going to get all this." And on top of that. All the energy that you expend, these shoes are so good, you're going to get extra energy on top yeah, of that. Yeah, don't so you're going to cheat. We've talked about so energy return so, on this So we feel yeah. like there's a cheat factor involved in this. Mm -hmm. And and I would say that, first off, you know, you don't have to wear zero shoes. I wear zero shoes. I love them. I think they're great. I, I've been wearing sandals, all kinds of barefoot shoes for years, and I think that you've got one of the best products. I Get your feet on the ground. Mm -hmm. Get your feet strong, get your legs strong, get your body strong, and then don't give up. You know, I don't, I, I don't like to give, I don't like to give advice too much to people. You know, I train really hard, Stephen. I, mm -hmm. I push myself. I'm 55 years old. I, you know, I, I, when you get to be a certain age, you realize the importance of things, right? So for me, I'm, I'm, I'm religious. I ran this morning. I was on the road. I got up. I ran this morning. Um. I would say that, you know, learn how to run right, right? So if you have the right shoes, you're going to have to have the right stride. So on your website, as well as other websites, there's plenty of advice on, on there. There's, well, there's and, books. And to interrupt and highlight that, I mean, the thing about what we talk about is it's not about the footwear. It's about the form. That's right. It's just that certain footwear makes it all very difficult, if not impossible, to That's have right. natural form. That's right. And others can help engender that. And, and this is... This is the thing. I, I want to ask a, another weird question again from your experience dealing with Native communities. And by the way, you didn't mention that, you know, according to 23andMe and from your own sure. research, you know that you have Native... Um, a lot of things. Yeah. Um, so it's not... You're, you're not just some random white guy talking about Native Americans, um, which doesn't mean, you know, you can't talk about something, but sure. people get very uptight when uh -huh. it's like, you know, what, how can you talk about And that? I do uh, spend time in, the, in those communities, you know, and, and I do talk to, you know, I, for my life, I've, I've been around a lot of Native Americans. So. The, one of the things that, like, when I think about, um, there's a well-known Tatamara woman, um, Lorena, who's won a bunch of races Absolutely. lately running in some cheap plastic Absolutely. shoes. Absolutely. And the Tatarmara in general, what's so interesting is that when they're running, it's a v whole different flavor than when you watch Americans running, typically, where it's not 
the, there's not as much of a goal, even when the goal is they've got to get somewhere by some time. Right. They have a different attitude about sure. doing that. Absolutely. Have you seen anything similar? Or what do you see you Abs know, in the Native communities? Absolutely. Same idea? Absolutely. Same thing. Tara Amara, uh, uh, um, the Rara Muri are mm -hmm. the same as the Hopi. They're the pe they're people of peace, right? So they're both by canyons, Copper Canyon, Grand Canyon. There's mm -hmm. a lot of similarities. Once again, if you ask the Hopi, they'll tell you that the Taramara came from them. Oh, really? Yes. Um, but, you know, that's neither here nor there. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. What was that? I was going to respond. Well, just, just sort of the, kind of like there's two things that I'm really curious about. One, what can we learn from right. people who've been doing this? Lorana, Lorana Ramirez, yeah. the, the woman you're speaking of. Yeah. So... Um, she talks about, and then there's a great uh, documentary that Gala Garcia Bonel just did on her. Um, she talks about dancing with the earth, mm. right? And you dance with the earth. Mm. You don't, and I'm a great dancer. I'm lucky. As a man, my, my mother taught me how to dance when I was young. My mom used to love to dance. She's passed away since. But So in the, t in the kitchen, I was taught salsa, everything as a kid growing up. So for me, dancing is really easy. And when I start to get tired and fatigued mm -hmm. and I'm losing it, you don't want to start. As soon as you start pounding your feet, as soon as you're not dancing with the earth again, mm -hmm. you're, you've lost it. You're off the horse. And I got to tell myself once in a while, I, I, you know, I can hear myself breathing. I can feel my feet pounding. And I'm like, you're off it. You're not dancing anymore. You're pounding. Slow down. Breathe center and get back to just your feet are just we're dancing with the earth mm. we're not oh, oh, we're not going out trying to get it we're just we're going mm. we're, we're allowing the vibe of the of the earth and our feet and just that movement mm. to just allow us to to continue on and once you get going that way it's it's hard to stop mm. versus like i want to go Okay, my watch says I got to this split exactly. and now I got to stop. Exactly. Okay, now I got it. Okay, now I breathe for a few seconds. It's just like. It, it reminds me of um, uh, there's a track meet here. They have a track meet series here in Colorado um, every summer, this summer, probably not. And for a couple of the races, people will bring out their little kids, like three to five, and they're adorable. It would only be cuter if they were puppies. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, the gun goes off. They don't know what happened. It's like, ah. And then, then people yell, run, and they run. Um, but the thing that I love is there's times where I've watched kids where, uh, you know, they're having fun, and then clearly they stop having fun, and then they just stop running until they're ready to have fun again, and they get up and start again. That's right. And, and what you're describing, I love this, the metaphor of dancing with the earth, is is again tuning in and having more of a relationship with yourself and the world simultaneously than the goal of I need to do it in this time and get right. from here, you know, do right. this amount of distance. And, that's right. And, and I guess if we wanted to sum it all up, I mean, that's a big chunk of what we've talked about as, sure. as really part of a native way yeah. that people don't typically think about. Right. Um, when they run. And when you're and when you're dancing with Mother Earth, if you're stepping on her toes, she's going to tell you. It's like, yo, man, you should get off my feet. It's like, what are you doing? And, and you're not feeling this. You're yeah. not feeling the dance. You're not feeling the movement. Mm. Go back to, if we're going to go back to just straight how to, in, in my mind, I would suggest just try and clear your mind and go back to... You may even have to make a song up about how ridiculous this point is and how stupid you feel <laughs> and how sick of everything you are. Just get the words going in your mind and concentrate on that. Get your mind off of whatever's holding well, you back. Well, in fact, what you're describing now is something else that's really fun, which is if you, and this goes back to place naming, if you give voice to the internal experience, anything that's seemingly locked in place will often unlock because you just said it. And in fact, sometimes you, not, I, would, I would suggest not just singing in your head, but singing it out loud. I have a, um, it's a, kind of a practice of sort. It's really a bit of a habit or it's almost in a way a hobby. Um, someone gave me this idea years ago and I do it. When I'm feeling particularly happy, I'll say it out loud. I'll just say I'm happy. Yeah. And by just acknowledging that one, it kind of makes it even, it makes it more real like we talked about before. And it kind of, it creases, expands it. Now, if I'm not happy and I go, like if I'm in a grumpy mood, I'll say I'm grumpy. And the irony there is it doesn't make that expand. It makes it dissipate. Right. 
So there's an interesting thing, and the idea of singing it out loud. Sure. Um, there's a comedian, Maria Bamford, who has a really funny bit about singing, singing your demons that I won't do because I won't do it justice, and it's way funnier if you find her. But anyway, but, um, but that's a really interesting thing. And, and I think the other point that I like from what you're making is if we do this, using this idea of dancing with the earth and not stepping on Mother Earth's toes, these are great metaphors. Um, for us, they're a metaphor. For other people, it's, quote, reality. And I'm not using air quotes to make that, to diminish it, sure, but just sure, to highlight the mm -hmm, difference. Mm -hmm. um, but if you use that, what we like to say is running barefoot or even in sandals or in something minimalist, you become your own coach. That's right. And that's what we're talking about right. in a way is listening to all of this information so that you don't need some technique. You don't need a specific right. thing. That's right. You'll eventually figure it out. Now... There's things that we can do to shortcut that process. Sure. We can give you little tips. We can you know, sure. say whatever. We can put you in different shoes. Sure. But fundamentally, I mean, and I'm really in, it's taken, a, well, it's taken me a while to kind of come full circle in this conversation. That's what we're really talking about is what does it look like from this other perspective, from a perspective where connection to the world and others mm -hmm. was part of the daily worldview. How can we apply that as runners to become better runners, not with the goal of doing better, sure. but better because it's more enjoyable, it's safer, it's, um, uh, what more do you need other than more, more enjoyable and safe? I think that it also makes you a better person. It can. If you connect to that spot in yourself and try and hold that space mm. and remember how you hurt, we all hurt, we all have pain. You, some of it is self-inflicted. <laughs> some of it isn't. Yeah. But particularly in, in, in this day and age, I think that we, compassion is, you know, you don't do anything for the ego in the Native American way, right? Mm. To say that I'm going out for a run because I'm a badass and boy, am I fast. And I feel good because I'm fast. These are the wrong motivations, mm. and that's not the, at least in that particular way, that's right. not the motivation. The motivation for most of us is that, and I think that initially when we start off that way, we look at the shoes. If we're used to running in a particular thing, and we're, we're coming into this from the first, for the first time where we're trying to make a change into running into a minimalist shoe or a barefoot or a sandal, that oftentimes we say there's something wrong with this shoe right after we try it on right there's, these shoes are these are crap what do you that my foot's killing me well okay well we know that it's not the shoe so what we're doing is we're we're, we're reimagining Depends ourselves shoe, and our yes. right that's it yeah. could not be the right shoe for the right person yeah. but uh, but all in all you don't have the shoe doesn't have to fit you you were getting we're eschewing all of these like I said before, let's try to go back to if we can once one once a day, mm. once a week out, out of our running schedule, leave our watch, our headphones, our animals, our running partners, mm. and get used to the sound of your own breath. And because that's where it all starts off with. It's the breath, right? Mm. It's all about you're going to it's going to be your song. It's mm. going to be your. Uh, it's going to determine how fast you're going to go. It's going to determine how long you're going to go. Mm. So concentrate on that. Get your body right. Stay on the form. Lose some weight. <laughs> right? Most of us could stand to lose a little bit of weight. It's also a diet. It's also sleep. Mm. It's also a way of living. It's all these different things. There's it's not a pan. There's more. no panacea to the native ways going to get you better. Right. All I'm trying to say is that we know we're interconnected. We know we have a lot of imagination. Let's connect with the world outside of us with our imagination in, the, in a way that is somewhat new to us mm. in the regard that we, we're not going for the same outcomes. Mm. Those outcomes will come 
if you work hard and if you and if you stay on the path, right, you will lose a little weight. You will feel better about yourself. You will be stronger. You will possibly be more flexible. But that's all up to you. It's not, the shoes aren't doing that for you. you. The training's not doing that for you. You're just you. You fit yourself into this. Your water you now fill up that particular vase, whatever it may look like, and make your own. Thing. You know, everybody's, you run, you run a particular distance. You're built that way. That's Steven. Exactly. You know who you are. So what we're trying to say, I guess, at the end of the day, Steven, is figure out who you are. If you live in America, guess what? You're a Native American. You were born here. You're not a Native American in that regard. You don't, you weren't taught in a particular way, but these ways are all open to you. Mm -hmm. And people have been naming these places all around you for thousands of years, for millions, not millions, for thousands of years, for a long time. So these, the names are all out there for us. They've been named and forgotten thousands and thousands of times before Mm -hmm. that. Use your imagination and lose yourself in that world for a little while. It'll be fun. Mm -hmm. Get strong. Go out in the forest. Um, I'm going to ask you a question, and, and, and if you don't have an answer, it's okay, because I know I'm, I'm putting you on the spot by asking. Um, because people love to dive into things, and there's different ways of doing that. Of course, right now, it's a little trickier. Um, sure. There's not, there's not races happening where you sure. can find some of these right. things going on, right. especially some of the native races. But um, are there any books or other resources that you would recommend if somebody wants to find out more about um, let's call it the you know the native history of running, or just the, <laughs> or, or anything that would be just a, an issue sure. would riff on what we've talked about right. that would be useful that people could then find and extract some nectar right. from you know, when they right. then take it out on their next run. Yeah, I, you know they're they're fairly tight lipped about the whole thing. They don't really go out and tell people what I've gotten. I've gotten just from observation and reading, mm. like. Uh, Alfonso Ortiz, who's passed away now, he's uh, from Santa Clara Pueblo, or San Juan Pueblo he was, rather. He wrote a great book called The Tewa World in the 70s, and he talked about, you know, in the races, um, at all the Pueblos, they have the annual races, right? You run up and down the the track. They all race in in garb, so it's a beautiful thing to see. They're racing basically naked, like barefoot. Mm -hmm. And he's training for the races, and he's in the plaza. And there's some, there's some old blind guy out there. Blind guy calls him over. He's like, young one, come here. So says, what are you doing? I'm training for the races. He goes, okay, that's good. You have strong legs. Keep them, keep them strong. You're working out here in the patio. That's great. Look up to the sacred mountain. Socomo, see that one over there? So this is, if, if you know uh, New Mexico at all, this is uh, outside of Española between there and Taos. Really beautiful mountain. You can see it's directly from the Pueblo. Once you make it to the top of the mountain and back, you're going to be ready. Your legs will feel strong. You're going to feel like you could fly. Now, boy, great. Thanks. Well, how, what am I supposed to do now? So what he's basically saying is, so in your, your sprint work, you also want to tie in some mountain work to that, son. You want to do your sprint work, but you also want to make sure that you can go up there to come back, tie all this together, because we're going to bring the masculine with the feminine. The feminine is the river down by the Pueblo. The masculine is the mountain. Mm. So you, it's, to, it's about heaven and earth being tied together. So in there, it's just regular training advice, right? Do well, your sprints. Run really hard. Go up mountains. Well, it's, it's regular training advice, but we've turned it into training right, advice right, right, right. instead of something that's much, much richer than that. And even that... People don't get like you made me think of um, Arthur Lydiard, the uh, famous coach from New Zealand. Who that's what he would do. I mean, he had all of his runners, whether 800 meter runners right. or marathoners. Right. They did tons of, of running up mountains, yeah. and they did tons of running down mountains, yeah. and they did tons of running flats. Right. And they did t- I mean, right. he was making well rounded runners by having them really right. constantly connecting with right. the world. And he made shoes that looked like these right. for his runners. Right. And um, and we can get into a whole conversation sure. about any connection between Native Americans and Maori. That's a whole other uh, oh, yeah, thing. But, same. But, but suffice it to say, I mean, people have taken some of these natural ideas and tried to, in a way, ossify them and turn them into a thing sure. instead of a process. Right. And so we're right. talking about a process. Right. Rather than so the process is, is marrying, is 
planting the tree, mm. <laughs> your practice, yeah. right? No cheating in anything, right? Yeah. This is just like, a, no matter what you're, if you're going to be a fencer, a basketball player, whatever it is, do your practice. Um, and you don't have to kill yourself. You do, that's my thing, I guess. It's like, you know, that you're, in your world, overtraining and doing the same repetitious physiological yeah. uh, impact over and over again is just going to break you down. So the, the sprinting mixed in with the other stuff, here we have a comprehensive way of doing things. Put out in a very blasé fashion. It's like, yeah, you know, you want to do man. that. Yeah. Uh, there's a great book, Hopi Running. Um, mm -hmm. that, uh, I forget the author's name. Anyway, he's, he's, he, he's not a runner. He's Hopi. And he's interviewing a Hopi runner in the beginning for the book, and he's talking about he he's relaying. Well, when we first met, we started talking. Right. Well, he's he's like as joking. Well, let's go on a jog. Okay. I think that he was teaching at Illinois um, University, Illinois Champ or was that Urbana Champagne? Urbana Champagne. Yeah. Okay. So he was teaching there, and they're running around the little track. And he asked a Hopi guy, the 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 author asked his friend, the Hopi guy. So when you when you, when do you train? How, how how far do you go? Like generally, I want to get a sense of. And the guy just smiles and smirks and doesn't say anything and just kind of goes, doesn't say anything. He goes, well, he asked him again. He goes, oh, you know, uh, I go out to the fence and back generally. Okay, what does that mean? It means that you run as far as you want to that day and as right. far as you can and as far as you feel like running that day. It's so funny. There's, we, we keep coming back to these super simple things. Um, there's a whole movement going on right now in the weightlifting and strength community about um, velocity-based training. Basically, mm -hmm. let's say you're doing a bench press or a push-up, doesn't matter. Okay. You're going to go as fast as you can, oh. and you stop when, you've, when you can't go a certain percent as fast. Let's say you can, you know, suddenly you're 80% as fast, you're done. Now, with sprinting training, they say, you know, go as fast as you can, okay. and once you're under 95%, you're done. And all of this is basically about self-regulating. Right. It's about one day you're going to feel strong, take advantage. One day you're going to feel weak, take it easy. Exactly. And all of this, again, what we're talking about is just making all of this about connecting to ourselves, connecting to the world around us. That's right. And, and let that sort of chaotic nature of that, that unpredictable Absolutely. nature of that, Absolutely. be a piece of the puzzle, sure. something you engage sure. with, something that's a part of the process, not interfering with the process. Sure. And this is a, is a beautiful way to think about it all. And I think that if we... If we look at it from the six degrees of separation angle, too, it's it's just one person breaking out of that group or that nucleus in one direction to connect that grouping with another grouping of somebody else who is possibly coming out of yeah. that. So that's how we start a grassroots movement. And how do you continue a grassroots movement? You keep your feet in the grass. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you water it. You nurture it. You water it. it you right. nurture it. Exactly. You get it room to grow. That's right. And literally. Yeah, literally. Feet on the grass. You know, I mean, this morning I was out on the grass. Man, does that feel really good, right? That we can get. That's a whole other story. And then what's his name? Morton, who just did the book as well. Uh, Rich. Uh, he was the guy who trained um, in uh, the bear. Uh, you can do it. Um, Barefoot. Okay. The uh, Born to Run in Born to Run. Yeah. Oh, he was oh, Orton. Eric Orton. Eric oh, yeah, Orton. Yeah, yeah. He's got a new book out. Or yeah. He's got a book out that came yeah. a little. You know, and a lot of I was reading through it. And it's, a lot of the same thing. I think that just common sense, you know. Mm -hmm. I, and I, what when I say Native American running, I'm I'm thinking more about using it for motivation mm -hmm. and ha asking all of us to not just jock out so much, but be a little geeky, get a little artsy fartsy with your run. You know, use your imagination. Don't you're still going to look, you know, tough when you're running. You're still going to look like you're, you're good running down the street. Just you know. I try to keep it light, you know. One of the easiest ways that you can do this, this is something that I actually do even though I'm a sprinter, I'm on the track most of the time, is use the terrain around you instead of trying to avoid it. If, you, if you're if you on a trail and there's a rock that's at a little bit of a ledge, step on that yep. rock yep. and push yourself diagonally yep. sideways. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, even if you're on the track, you know, run in a run a serpentine thing don't go straight that's right just, you know just mix it up a little bit just get do those anything. muscles all get those all yeah. those muscles working yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and get those reflexes you you know your mind can handle so this is why you know trail running i think is is essential at one point mm. to getting you because it's you know you can be on the bike 
and like, oh, this is so great. But as soon as the bike starts hit the rocks and you're like, okay, right. now I got to flip the whole thing over again. So we're working with our bodies and we're working with reflexology as well. And that, that is definitely going to help. I think spur your imagination along a little bit as well too. You're going to get frustrated, and then if you can break through the emotions, then I and well, try to use those for you. Again, it's a learning process because I know. Um, I mean, I, again, I don't do distance running, but I but I always just like run places, and so for trails, the most interesting thing for me, and this again connects to everything we're talking about, is that on the one hand, you need to pay attention to where you're putting your feet. On the other hand, you have to do that by having, let's call it wide vision metaphorically, so that you're really sort of attentive to what's many steps ahead of you and simultaneously what's right underneath your feet. And that kind of open awareness is super, super fun. And you can start barreling up and down hills yes. when you do that. Otherwise, you're tentative. That's right. You see things as obstacles That's right. rather than something you can use. I don't know what that word would be. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, anyway, I, now, now, yeah. now brilliantly we're kind of going around in circles. Anything you want to leave with? Because we got to get out of sure, here. Sure, let's do it. Let's get out of here. Oh, well, let's get out of here. <laughs> I'd um, like to leave with saying thank you for having me. And thank you. Uh, hopefully we've sparked some interest today. I, I, I don't know, but I think it's a, it's an interesting concept. You know, as I, as I said in the beginning, it's, it's, it's interesting to think about America mm. these days, con considering how we are so vast and so, um, I think questioning right now, I think everybody's kind of like, you know, wow, okay, this is interesting. Well, right. Re reality's pretty different right now, you know? So right, right now people are grasping for anything they can hold on to in the midst of a shit ton of uncertainty. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is, Try to find a little solace in the in the in the wide mm. array of of feelings and hopes and fears that have already been put aside for us these future generations long time ago, and and they're waiting for us to pick up the call to to bring it forward to the future generations about what it's like just to be on planet Earth and to live. And you know, I give. Uh, thanks, Stephen, to the air all the time, to the sky. I apologize to it for the things we're doing to it. I say I'm so sorry. Mm. If it were up to me, beautiful sister sky, we would not be doing this to you. Thank you so much mm. for allowing me to just be. So maybe a little uh, humbleness, mm. I think, a little humility. We're all kind of learning that right now. Um but also trying to to be positive, you know, and, and be strong and bring it forward a little bit. I don't think we have to be so macho and uh, like sterilized and cut off with one another. Let's try and keep our human connection because I think that one of the things that the the virus is doing is pushing us apart further and further. It's definitely highlighting things about how we do and don't connect and what that means and what to do about it under extreme circumstances and and hopefully uh, at some point in the not too distant future normal or normal ish circumstances yeah. and, um, and what that's going to look like it's um, it, it, it is a fascinating opportunity which is a glib way of saying again it's a lot of uncertainty and we're going to be mm, to a certain extent working with or fighting with our mind's ability to adjust to that or tolerate that mm -hmm. or navigate that absolutely and, and I think everything we've talked about especially if people are able to go out um, regardless of whether you're in a city or a, or not I mean even when I was living in Manhattan there's a certain weird mm. naturalness to all the mm. concrete that's hard to explain mm. until you're in it so much there's um, a beautiful uh, New York Times have you seen the I think it was just out this last weekend it's a, a computer image of Manhattan when it was like way before it was even settled, and you can go, you look at it, and oh, cool. it's a, it was an amazing forest. It was mostly a farm. Yeah, I mean, I, the, one of one of the apartments I lived in used to back up to a farm. In fact, the, the there was a little um, corner store that was the farmhouse mm -hmm. for this multi-acre farm on the west side um, that had turned into some other thing. But yeah. the, but my apartment backed up to a little bit of, of of green space that was part of that old farm. Yeah, from only 150 years earlier, it was really amazing right, to, to right, see. Right, right. Anyway. Enough, but yes. we, we can keep doing this all Thank day. Thank you. But we're not going to. <clears throat> anyway, 
<clears throat> first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you for being part of this conversation. Obviously, we'd love to have you chime in with any thoughts, questions, et cetera, that you have. If you have any questions for me, just drop me an email, move at jointhemovementmovement.com. If anybody wants to get in touch with you. we uh, I will be getting the... Uh, Website, my website up soon, um, yeah. aslontimes.org. So spell, we spell, will be wait, talking about oh, spell it. A Z T L A N T I M E S dot org. org. Okay. We're on Squarespace, we'll be up in about a month. But we'll awesome. be talking about these things and other things, other arcane subjects <laughs> on the website. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so, um, and as I said before, you know, this is all about you. We're creating a movement about movement. Join the movement movement. So if you want to, go to www.jointhemovementmovement.com where you can find all the past episodes. You can um, find out all the different places you can engage with this content, whether you just want to listen to the podcast or watch the video or chat with us on Facebook or Instagram, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. As I like to say, simply if you want to be part of the tribe, please subscribe. And most importantly, enjoy, have fun, and live life feet first.